Well hello everybody, a very warm welcome to my channel Louise Savage Muses. Welcome back if you've visited before and um, a big hearty welcome if this is your first dip into this rambling, musing, uncharted territory. Um, so I have been thinking, as the title of the video would suggest, a lot about binging recently um, because certainly over the winter and actually we've realised that during the summer holidays um, my husband and I love nothing more than having a series to binge watch on the telly. Um, things like, I don't know, Breaking Bad, The Sopranos, um, Ozark, oh gosh, I, I mean the list could go on. Um, and there's something really wonderful about that sort of snuggly addiction um, and, and sharing, um, you know, the the history of the characters and watching them develop and the twists and turns and it got me thinking about binge reading because I have those of you who follow my channel will know that just recently I've been rereading um, Kate Moss's um, trilogy now the third one the ghost ship's been published uh, recently and um, I haven't got hold of a copy yet but I'm sure I will very soon um, and I've thoroughly enjoyed getting stuck into these and I was I was sort of thinking well this is kind of like you do I, I do binge read um and I was I was sort of trying to get my head around what this all meant I even went so far as to look the word up in the dictionary and I I kind of thought that it would be a really modern word binging um and actually it has become it's 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 used they think far more since about 2019 it really became um, prevalent in our um, vocabulary, contemporary vocabulary. But actually, uh, by the way, if I get plunged into darkness, it's because it's absolutely howling down one minute here with rain and the next minute there's glorious sunshine. So it's been really difficult. I'm not very good at the lighting anyway, as you know. Um, so today's proved, well, impossible really for someone as unskilled as I am. Um, anyway, I was talking about binging, but the first use, the first recorded use of the word binge is it was from 1854. Um, and they think there's some connection with the idea of soaking a wooden vessel. I think you might do that to make the wood expand, perhaps. I don't know. Um, but anyway, I'm rambling on. Well, I would be, wouldn't I? Because this is my musings. Um, and I realised that actually one of the things that had, had got me reading in the first place um, was binge reading um so I'd, i've sort of gone back to my childhood bookshelves and and tried to sort of trace a, a kind of history um of my own binge reading experiences and i'd be really interested to hear yours as well because I, I i i love a binge read and yet i don't i don't tend to do it as often these days um so my first brace yourselves if there's anybody out there who's of a similar age to me this will be really nostalgic, I suspect. What I have in my hand here, um, this series of uh, novels by Laura Ingalls Wilder, and I know there's a little bit of controversy around her because of some of her, um, you know, attitude towards Native Americans and so on, but she was right, she was a Victorian, you know, and we have to kind of understand, we don't have to empathise remotely with those attitudes but we do have to or sympathize I should say but we do have to we can't deny that that thankfully the world has changed um but these little books I mean I remember receiving this I don't think there's a date in here little house in the big woods uh no but I've written I've written very proudly and neatly in there but I think I was really quite young when I had this and um and they're sort of uh autobiographical it's a fictionalised account, I think, of, of a lot of Laura Ingalls Wilder's life in, in America, growing up in America. Uh, and you can see there we've got a, a bear featuring a bear attack. Um, and I remember this, I think this was probably one of the very first books that I read independently that felt like a grown up book with lots of pages in it. Um, and I went on to absolutely guzzle up and devour the books in the entire series and so I think you know I really I really remember pining for the next book and um I mean the, these are all ones that I owned as a child so I think they would probably would have been bought for me at different Christmases and birthdays and I would have had to wait 
possibly a year, you know, nearly to read the next one because my birthday and Christmas are quite close. Um, so I, I sort of, it took me back to the excitement of that. And then I remembered um, this wonderful set of books as well, you know, the C.S. Lewis uh, Lion, the, the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, interestingly, is missing. Hmm, wonder where that might be. Actually, I think it's had so much love because, of course, all of these books I read to Simon uh, or read with and um, and also then to my subsequent children. Uh, I think probably The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe has actually disintegrated um, from so much love and use. Um, so, you know, that, that started it off. Oh, and this wonderful girl, sassy, uh, Anne of Green Gables, of course. Um, I think there are seven or eight or possibly nine um, Anne novels. And, and you know, this this is part of the pleasure of binging, is especially when it's kind of ch was children's fiction, that I felt I was growing up with these people. Blimey, the rain really is pouring. I don't know if you can hear it now, banging against the window. Um, lashings of rain. I loved Anne of Green Gables because she was quite naughty and she didn't mean to be and she yeah she was just full of this wonderful redhead full of character an orphan uh, living with um, Marilla and what was he called the wonderful um, I just oh the opening the opening of this story when Matthew when Matthew Marilla and Matthew are brother and sister aren't they and they don't have children and um, Marilla suggested that they have an orphan um, to help them look after the farm because they're not getting any younger and Matthew goes to the station to collect this orphan child and is really worried because it's a girl and uh, and she's not just any old girl she's Anne um, so you know just just I remember again um, sort of I think the reason I only own a couple of these is because I read most of them from the library I remember they were white bound beautiful books hardback books and just that pleasure of reading one and then rushing to the library to get the next one. Um, and I've, I've read and reread them as well. I think that's the thing about these books. Um, I also really remember um, the, the Wizard of Earthsea series as well, that lovely trilogy by Ursula Le Guin. Probably the first sort of really deep fantasy novels that, that I read. And in a way, a, a, a kind of um, precursor to Harry Potter, I suppose, because Ged... Uh, the young man in the story is uh, an, an aspiring wizard. Well, not exactly aspiring, but he ends up going off to wizarding school. I don't think he's that keen. Um, and uh, and he needs to sort of get rid of this creature that he's unleashed. It's kind of possessed because he's got this natural instinct for magic. Um, and, um, and Ursula Le Guin invented this whole... I don't know if there's a map, but um, these are all... It's, it's you know, there's Earthsea there. So these novels were all set on this amazing invented archipelago um, and I just remember one loving sort of looking at the map, poring over the maps and exploring um, where the characters were off to and the dragons and the, all that kind of thing. And then um, moved on, sorry I have, if I, I keep disappearing because I, I couldn't hold all these at once, there's just too many. That's why I'm on the floor by the way because <laughs> there's no way I could have balanced these on my knees this week. Um, as I was um, rummaging through my shelves, um, I'd, I'd forgotten about these. I don't know if any of you ever read these books by Barbara Willard. And again, most of them I would have had from the library. And I remember getting some of these secondhand as well. Um, and this was a, a, a sort of family saga. Um, Barbara Willard is a British writer who um, lived on the Sussex coast somewhere. And, um, and her novels, that it's a family saga, that's, I can't remember the name of the family, but it spans from sort of the 15, 15th century right the way through to the 17th century. Real sort of adventurous tales with twists and turns and absolutely dominated by the Sussex, land, Sussex landscape. Um, and yet her books seem to have, I, I haven't seen them on the shelves. I think she wrote a few for adults, but mainly for children, um, historical fiction. And I, I, you know, I don't, I've never read any of her adult books, so that sparked my curiosity. And um, and I think she was a very early um, understated environmentalist because she campaigned really passionately for one of the local forests, um, local to where she lived, I think it was called Ashdown Forest, 
um, to be bought by the local council so that um, it wouldn't be chopped down and, and, and ruined. And, um, and I think at some point in the 80s, um, she was successful in achieving that. So really interesting woman, um, very sort of uh, almost reclusive, very private. I don't think much is known about her. Um, but clearly a, a really observant, I mean, I remember these novels as being absolutely exquisitely written. And you know, when you're absolutely rooting for the characters um, and their injustices become your injustices. Um, yeah, I love them. Puffin books as well. Yeah, another nostalgia. So I've already got a tower and I haven't even got anywhere with this yet. Um, but but what, what I suppose I'm doing is just reflecting on my own personal history of binge reading um so the next things that i looked at on my shelves that that created a, a real nostalgia were um these um uh, the maya angelou um series and again the, there are lots missing here i don't I, you know sometimes i've lent them to somebody or um again you know it's because i've had them from the library rather than read my own copies but these are absolutely much loved and and I can still remember how I felt when I read I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings for the first time. Um, I was at uni and um, a friend of mine bought me this for my birthday. So I would have been in my, I suppose, probably about 19, 20. Um, and I had, don't, I, I think, you know, probably the first um, novel that I ever read by an Afro-American. Um, and what a, what a woman she was you know I, I I love I occasionally you know when you're feeling a bit low um I'll I'll go to YouTube and I'll find a clip of Maya Angelou talking about whatever it might be some aspect of her life or or something to do something political and I find it really really comforting because she's one of those women who was just so full of wisdom and had led such an extraordinary life and a life that really lends itself to 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 exploration and to binge reading because she she had such a range of experiences you know there, there was the trauma of her childhood her mutism um and then you know her career as a singer dancer actor poet activist you name it she did it um so yeah i mean i i i inhaled as simon likes to say these books. I'm just gonna have to move because my legs are going a bit dead. <sighs> I don't know whether that's an age thing or whether I've probably always done that but if I sit too long in one position on the floor. Oh gosh now can you see me? Probably I don't know. Anyway and then um, I stumbled across this on my shelves. Um, Paul Scott staying on which won the Booker Prize at some point um, and I'm holding this up because what I don't have on my shelves is my is copies of the Raj Quartet, which he also wrote. And again, I think um, I remember um, binge reading those over one summer when I was at home from university. Um, the Raj Quartet was televised as the Jewel in the Crown. And it tells the story of the disintegration of the British Raj um, in India. Um, and it starts with this young man called Harry Kumar, who's a journalist, and he's fallen on hard times because his father's business has gone to pot. Um, he was sent to school in England. Um, he is Indian, but he was sent to school in, to an English public school. So he's, you know, he's gone to school with all these very sort of highbrow British people. Um, and then he ends up having to go back to India. And he He's in this position where he is he British, is he Indian? He identifies with both cultures, but he doesn't really fit in in either. And he becomes treated with real suspicion, um, especially when he befriends um, a woman called Daphne Manners, who's um, a young English woman and develops a romance with her. And there's this really, really um, memorable scene both in the novel and in the fantastic BBC TV series that they did of the Jewel in the Crown, which they called the Jewel in the Crown. Um, and um, he and Daphne Manners um, have this very romantic um, sexual encounter in the, I think it's called the Bibigar Gardens. Um, and they are, uh, some, some local Indians um, come across them and of course are absolutely outraged 
at this liaison between an Indian and a, and a white woman and they gang rape her. Uh, so it's a very, very dramatic opening to this saga. Um, and it, it just, I mean, I remember watching the series. I remember, you know, reading the books and it, it really, um, again, had a profound effect on me because it, it opened up my interest in India, in empire, in the impact that we as British people had on, um, you know, other countries. Um, and I know that there's real mixed feelings about the Raj Quartet. I know that Salman Rushdie, for example, was critical of it because he, he sort of, you know, I, I can totally see his point of view. He's saying that, you know, the Paul Scott's um, portrayal of this period of history, because it, it starts pre-World War II and then and then goes beyond um, the Second World War. Um, it, it, it's, it, it sort of lays the disintegration of the Raj at the door of the white officer class um, rather than look, you know, looking at all of those Indians who were involved in in that disintegration. So I completely see where he's coming from. Um, all I can say is that that you know, I think he I think he really um, satirizes that class to a certain a certain extent, um, and I suspect it's quite a subtly honest portrayal of what what those people were like. And in this novel staying on it's about a, an expat couple as you can see on the front um who literally do stay on after the end the fall of the raj and um and he does really poke fun at them i mean that, that's one of the the wonderful things about reading this novel you get a real insight into how they were sort of coping with all these changes and the modernization of india um and i i can only thank paul scott for that because because it, it opened up my eyes to the whole problem. Um, so yeah, really, really interesting. And at some point I really must, I know that, I don't know, about 10 years ago, I rewatched The Jewel in the Crown and, and absolutely adored it again. Um, and, um, and at some point I really ought to go back to rereading the books. Um, what else have we got here? Oh yes. So here's another absolute binge worthy, um, book. So this is Roddy Doyle's Barrytown trilogy. Very, very different um, to the the, the uh, binge series that I've been looking at so far. You may well have come across the, uh, the, the all of these novels are set in Barrytown, Dublin, and um, they focus on this fantastic uh, working class family. Well, um, often not working at all, class family. Um, unemployed, I suppose is the word. Um, called The Rabbits, and um, one of my absolute favourite films is The Commitments. If you haven't seen it, rush out and watch it. It's absolutely glorious. Um, it's about uh, Jimmy Rabbit attempting to uh, set up a band, um, a sort of tribute to um, uh, soul music, and um, oh god they are such a dysfunctional group of people one of the things i love about roddy doyle's writing is that it's largely i mean it's almost like play script it's la very i don't know if you can see that but uh very largely dialogue and and the dialogue is just oh it's masterful i think probably my favorite is the van um that i think that's the th yeah it is it's the last of the of the three books um <laughs> It's about Jimmy Rabit's dad, um, who who sort of recommissions this ageing fish and chip van and decides that he's going to do good deeds for the community. Uh, and, you know, of course, it all goes really badly wrong. Uh, it's a wonderful take on male friendship. Um, yeah, I mean, you can see it just lights me up just even talking about it. So, yeah, wonderful. Um, oh, and these, Mary Renault, Fire from Heaven. Again, very different, but this is... This is a trilogy about Alexander the Great. This is the first one that I've got here, uh, which looks at his um, his early life, um, and you know has his fantastic uh, writing about um, the Macedonian court and um, Philip of Macedon, his father and his mother, and um, yeah, Mary Renault's writing is so beautiful. It's really, really. You kind of, it's like honey, you kind of wade through it. Um, and I have to be in the right frame of mind for it. 
Um, but when I am, I really enjoy reading her take on, on the classical world. It's super. Um, another um, sort of binge read of mine. Again, I haven't got many in my hand here, but these are um, Alexander McCall Smith's books um about so this the first one was the number one ladies detective agency and i think these have been serialized i've never watched them on the telly but um these are fantastic comfort reads i think um they focus on mara motsway who um is a uh an aspiring detective she sets up this female detective agency in botswana um and they're just it's it's almost like a series of short stories because she she solves these different crimes so each novel is several crimes that are kind of interwoven um and she also has this wonderful male friend called mr jtp oh i can't remember but he runs this company called speedy motors and they form this uh, romantic attachment and and you know the the whole way that their relationship unfolds is really rather wonderful too um and and there's just such warmth in here and and her wisdom and canniness she's she's sort of a bit miss marple she's like miss marple with with more soul <laughs> i would say um yeah absolutely love binging those um something else that i've binged in the past are kate atkinson's jackson brodie novels um he's a an ex-policeman um who sets up his own um oh, what do you call it not spying uh private detective that's the one uh his own private detective business and um and he's you know he's a really flawed human he has really dysfunctional relationships um but he, he, the cases that he gets involved in are, are fascinating. And they're a little bit different from your average detective novel because I just love Kate Atkinson, Atkinson's very sparse, uh, fantastic prose. Um, and actually, weirdly, when, when, I, when I went to my shelves, I, it's funny how you sort of start to see connections. Um, so... I picked up these because oh God, they're very heavy, but these are um, the novels of M.C. Scott. And again, these are novels that I have binge read um, and they focus on um, a, a Roman spy called Pantera, completely fictional, I think. Um, but my goodness, as, as Manda, her, she, she's the same woman. M.C. Scott is another is a pseudonym for Manda Scott, who wrote the fabulous Boudicca series, another series that I binge read. Um, and um, and so I, you know, when I found out that these were connect, were, were her writing as well, um, I, I just dived in or dove in. And um, so Pantera is a, I'm going to put these down if you wouldn't mind, because they're really flipping heavy. Um, Pantera is a is a Roman spy. He's kind of fed up with spying. He's had enough of the spy industry, um, but he keeps being, being given cases that he can't quite resist. He's working for the Emperor Nero, um, and what I love about it is her books is that that he is he's very like Jackson Brodie. That was what I was going to say. You know, very flawed, dysfunctional relationships. Not so keen on his job, <laughs> probably rather be doing something else, but can't resist getting sucked into these cases. And the the wonderful thing about them is that that her knowledge of the Roman world is superb. They're really, really well researched. And she takes you to so the first one I think is um, you know, Nero, Great Fire of Rome. Um, but there are others of the series. One of them takes you you know, end up at Masada which was a famous um, Jewish city that was um, besieged by the Romans. I was lucky enough to see it from the Jordanian border when I was over there last year. And I love novels that are set in that part of the world. You know, the Middle and Near East really fascinate me. Um, so you've got, you know, the Romans marching across desert and, um, and, and they're very cinematic in you know her storytelling it's it's grand scenes and it's high drama 
so um yeah i thoroughly thoroughly recommend i'll hold them up again they've got wonderful covers as well look um mc scott rome series um and then i was thinking about well i've been binge reading kate moss you know where where does and this is one of the reasons i made this video by the way because pardon me i've got the summer holidays round the corner um and oh i love to binge read over the summer so i've got a few binge series that i've started um and i think maybe that's the difference now is that when i find something binge worthy rather than actually binging them all in one go i spread out the binge <laughs> i don't know whether that's still binging but it kind of feels like it is so um i read uh, a year or so ago now i read um dissolution by cj sampson because as you know i absolutely love historical fiction i love crime and you know detect well detective um novels um and uh cj sampson has written many of these I don't, I don't know how many there are but they focus around this lawyer called shard lake um he's he's got um he's he's a hunched um you know physically uh well he's got a physical disability um and he works for thomas cromwell or at least he gets sucked in to working for thomas cromwell in this novel um, so it's, you know, it's Henry VIII, it's that period of English history, which is always really fascinating. And of course, the book's called Dissolution because this is the um, the inquiry into the dissolution of the monasteries. Um, and Shard Lake is sent off to a monastery in Sussex um, to uh, investigate because there's been this horrific murder where somebody's had their head severed. Um, and I just, I did thoroughly enjoy this. It's all marshy and misty and murky and twisting and turning corridors and unsavoury monks and what's not to like about it. And I don't know why I haven't read the next one yet, so maybe I'll do that over the summer. Um, so yeah, I think that's going to be a, a series that I really you know see right the way through to the end and love every minute of. Um, and there's a real Sussex connection coming up here because Barbara Willard was from Sussex, Kate Moss is from Sussex, um, CJ Sampson's, this novel is set in Sussex, there's Sussex everywhere, um, isn't Kate Atkinson also from Sussex? I don't know, somewhere that side of the country anyway, or is it Norfolk? Oh, that's not quite right, is it, geographically? And then finally, um, I'm going to pick up another one of these this summer, so again, this is, I think it's a couple of years since I read this, um, Elizabeth Jane Howard's The Light Years. And this is um, the first in the Casale Chronicles. Um, and these are about, oh no, this is Sussex as well. I'm sure it is. It is, yeah, the heart of Sussex. It's weird. Why is Sussex filtering into all of this fiction today? I don't know. Um, it's a bit spooky. What is it about Sussex that, yeah, pulls these writers? Why aren't they writing about Shropshire? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I need to write something about Shropshire. Um, so Elizabeth Jane Howard's series focuses on um, a, a family who have a bit of a, I would consider it to be quite a stately pile in Sussex. The family spend a summer together. It's the build up to the Second World War. Um, they're quite a wealthy family um the the sort of uh the senior figure who was in the first world war himself and is kind of worried about the whole sort of you know impact and the brewing of another war um and you're wondering how the next generation are going to cope with that because they are quite dysfunctional there's some really dysfunctional relationships Interestingly, the younger daughter is a lesbian and um, so it's quite interesting that we've got a sort of LGBT slant on this period of history because uh, Elizabeth Jane Howard, I think, was writing these in the 90s. Um, but it's reflecting back on, as I say, the interwar period at this stage. And then I think we spring on to the, the outbreak of war in the next one. Um, and... And so people who were writing at the time didn't necessarily focus on um, the LGBT angle so much. So, you know, I, I really want to see how these characters kind of unfold. Um, and actually, the younger sister, the one I was just talking about, is probably the most empathetic character, I think, in the in the novel. 
from what I remember. Um, so yeah, there we go. So that's kind of my, God, that was a musy, rambling, waffly thing. Um, and I'm sorry that I'm on the floor, but there we are, I just am. And, and you'll be pleased to know the pins and needles gone, so that's good. So I will be able to stand up in a minute. Um, but thank you for watching, if you've made it to the end. And um, please do ping in your recommendations for things that I can just... What is it about these binge watchers? It's about, I think it's that whole thing of... It's a bit like my passion for longer novels. A lot of these are quite chunky, aren't they? Um, and I think it's that whole idea of spending a long time with different characters. And it's a bit like friendships, you know, you can, you can, you can not see a good friend for a couple of years and it really doesn't matter because you just pick up where you left off. And I suspect that, that what I like about these, these novels that are in series is that you can do exactly that. You can, you're revisiting the people, you're, you're often revisiting the same locations, although not always. Um, so you're building, they are like old friends, you know, um, and often picking up on the same sorts of themes as well, you know, like the impact of the war and, and, and what have you. Um, so hurrah for binge reading, I say. And um, and I really look forward to hearing what you think about it, too. I'm going to shut up now. I need to go out and do something in this murky weather. Um, take care, everybody. Bye.